If you get people on board with the vision where they're going, they will self-optimize your business. You won't have to go through the process of, please fill out this SOP, please follow the SOP, please come tell me when you do something wrong. Because management becomes a lot easier. <music>something big that's going to be happening in our society very soon. It's very obvious to a lot of us because we are in the internet. We love the idea of Elon Musk, we love this cutting edge technology and we're actually, what we do, we know that it's kind of weird to a lot of people but I just had a, a talk with my very very good friend, he actually lives here, he understands what I do and he still goes, you can make money on the internet? Like, you're serious. I was like, yeah, you know, I was telling a couple of people they're going to be here. It's a different job that they have. And his mind was blown away. Now, you have to remember, this guy has already traveled, and he's moved here to Vietnam. So he's already got this expanded mindset. Most people have no idea about what's going to hit them soon with the fourth uh, industri inter uh, uh, industrial revolution. So I want to talk about why this is super important to where we're at and how you can capitalize on it. How you're going to be able to, let's do the first bullet point. Lead teams effortlessly. And we talked about that specifically. How you're going to be able to create a, uh, a work team that even if you're using distributed workforce and they're working for other people, they actually want to work on your projects first. So if you got, you know, you know how it is like when you hire somebody on Upwork, they're probably doing 10 other people's works and you want, trying to get, you want your stuff done first, this is how you're going to be able to do that. They're going to be excited about working on your stuff first. You're never going to get tired or burned out. I see two phases of things. Somebody either deals with imposter syndrome, where they're like, I don't know if I can do this. I really want to do this, but I feel like I don't have a place of authority to do it. Or what they feel is, I've actually done my business a long time, and I've lost interest in it. And that's beginning to scare me because I know that if I don't stay competitive or if I don't stay up on it, then competition is going to come in and I'm just going to slowly wither away. And it's, it's a thought in, a lot, in the back of a lot of people's minds. So this, we're going to talk about how you're going to avoid that. And then last one, obviously, how do you can make yourself comp uh, competition proof for products and services. So the first thing I want to tell you right now is that, uh, who's, raise your hand if you've got a product-based business. Product, so, it's about half of you guys. I want to teach you that you're actually still in a service-based business. You sell products, but you're still doing service with everybody else. Is my, my, am I loud enough? Yeah. yeah, all right. Let's just get rid of this. Jet, Melanie, you have a quick question? No. All right. That if you really want to capitalize on what's going to happen, you have to think of yourself as service-based. Yes, you sell products to other people, but the way that you transact or where you do, uh, you talk to your employees, the way that you talk to your distributors and everything else, it is very much service-based. We'll, so we'll talk about what that means. All right. And ultimately what I want to do is show you what your unique competitive advantage is. And then when I'm talking specifically you, not your company, but you. Because if you understand what your unique competitive advantage is, you can create the right company around you that also has a competitive advantage. Make sense? Okay. That's what we got. So another thing is that what I'm going to teach you right now, this has actually always been possible. And a lot of people have done this before. And so when you go through the whole thing, you're like, yeah, you know what? There's a lot of been people like Elon Musk. But I'm also going to tell you it's actually far easier than it's ever been before because of just where we're at in society. And the last reason is that it's going to absolutely be necessary coming up. And this is the important factor that I want you to understand. That no longer is it going to be optional to do this. That if you don't do this, you will lose out. And ultimately, there's no better time than right now. Now, I put this slide up here for a couple reasons, because there literally is no better time to be alive in the world right now. No better time. More people die of overeating than starvation now. 
there's less wars than there's ever been than right now. Longest life expectancy around the world than right now. The ease of access to materials, products, workforce, it's never been easier. This is the best time to be alive. Oh, okay. So when we're going to talk about the fourth industrial revolution, but first I want to talk about a different revolution that happened. And this happened in the movie industry. So in about 2000, a movie came out called Memento. Anybody ever seen this movie? Oh, yeah. yeah. It won. Now, this is the weird thing about this movie. Is it kind of blew some things up? But even people in the industry didn't understand how weird and awesome this movie was. It took two years after it was created, for it to start getting awards. And after that, Christopher Nolan won award after award after award for a screenwriter. It became like, uh, except for like the, uh, uh, what is it, the Oscars. That was the only one. But all the other ma major ones, SAG, uh, like Poe, uh, if you go look at it, you Google up. This is like, there's about eight different ones. But what was interesting about this film, uh, who has not seen it? Okay, so this, I'll give you the premise. What happens is at the very beginning of the movie, you see the ending. You know exactly how the movie ends. But different than most movies, where that happens is that most movies go all the way to the very beginning and then they play it all the way out so then you kind of see the very end. This movie went backwards in time. So what they did is you saw the very ending, you knew how the ending was going to be, but you couldn't figure out how they got there. And then it took a little bit of step backwards in time and then they ran the film forward, so you got caught up, and they went back a little bit before. And so th this was the problem, is it just blew people's minds. Like, some people didn't understand how a movie could not be linear. And like, I remember having discussions. People were like, I just didn't understand that film. That was the weirdest thing whatsoever. And like, what, that was a bunch of mumbo jumbo. And then these other people were like, that was the best movie I've ever seen in my entire life. It's like, it's like could you imagine, like, you lived that guy. Oh, by the way, this guy couldn't remember anything. So that, that was part of it. So you're going to be like, what would it be like? And you'd have these big, I remember having these big talks. The point of this whole movie is that it gave the big reveal up front. And you had to figure out, how did the big reveal fit in? So that's what I'm going to do now. I'm going to give you the big reveal. And my job is to try to convince you that the reveal is true. So first, why do people like Elon Musk? He's a visionary. He's a visionary, right? Why do we like his visions? Because they're bigger than him. Exactly. They're bigger than him. I was hoping people would ask a bunch more questions or answers, but that was just straight up, right? <laughs> bigger than him. Is he a great employee? Anybody read his uh, biographies? He's awful. He's terrible as an, as an employer. But you know what's weird? People still want to work for him. There are stories of him going, they're like, I want to go home to my family. It's Christmas. I want to hang out with them. And he goes, you can go home when the product's done. Or you can leave. And they stay. Why do people stick around for that? He doesn't pay well either. They stick around because he's a visionary. And what was the other reason? No, you said it. I already told you. It's on you now. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> He's, he's doing something bigger than himself. People want to be involved in something bigger than themselves. They want to be involved in change. They want to be involved in something that they feel they can contribute to. This is a big reveal. Because of the fourth industrial revolution, fourth, can I just call it the, the, the fourth IR? It's going to make it a lot easier. The fourth IR everybody's going to start focusing on self-actualization. So how many people have heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? So we're, if you don't know, we're going to go over it. So self-actualization is the top of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and I'll talk about that a little bit. So let's see what the real possibilities that's coming up. So the, uh, let's talk about the four industrial revolutions and the impact that they had on society. The first one was steam. How many of you guys remember this from history class? How many of you have never heard of this before? Go ahead, raise your hand. It's OK if you don't know. Great, this is awesome. So in society, there's these 
really three big moments that happened that, compel, or that uh, pushed us forward. It pushed forward technology and allowed us to grow to what, we, what the societies we have right now. And the first one was steam-powered engines. So when somebody, or steam-powered and also water-powered um, windmills to be able to grind grain. So what that allowed to happen is that now we're able to uh, mass um, harvest food and transport food. So you no longer had location dependence on the food that you could grow. So you could easily start shipping. This is where trains started being, um, a lot of train, train routes started being put into place. So it allowed for transportation of people and materials. So you no longer were confined to like, uh, for me to survive, I have to get you know, a wood within my one day's walking. You could ship it all in. Okay, the second one happened about 100 years later was the division of labor. So instead of one person, or instead of you having to make your own wagon wheel every single time, and not only was it just one person making a wagon wheel inside of, your, uh, inside of the, um, maybe your own little town village, you had a team of people in a village somewhere else assembling wagon wheels. So one person would just do the band around the wheel. One person would make the spokes, and that's the point of division of labor. And what that allows to do as a society was to be able to produce a lot more things more efficiently. And then about 100 years later, so you can, you can read the notes up there, and then about 100 years later, we had the electronic and IT and automation production. So this allowed us to not only produce things even more efficiently, but it removed another problem, which was education. So, um, I'll talk a little bit more about why these are important. But the last one is this next one that's coming up. We don't really know exactly what this is. But this is one that Elon Musk keeps on talking about. This is the one where we talk about, you know, we're now going to need a universal income. Who have heard about universal income? OK, so the rest of you, what we're projecting is because of robotics coming in and everything become completely systematized and AI starting to write programs, that normal workforce is just going to be gone. All these jobs are going to be removed for a lot of people. And to be able to sustain them, we're going to have to essentially give people a universal income, enough to be able to survive. Because there won't be enough jobs to give to everybody. And that's kind of scary in a lot of ways. Because for a lot of people, they find their identity in work. And so if you take that away, people are going to start wondering, what is my life worth? Make sense? Mm -hmm. We here have an advantage, because we'll be the ones that will always probably have jobs. We're on the cutting edge. We're going to take advantage of this and be able to stay ahead of things. But most people won't. All right, so here's Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If you've never seen this before, this guy had this theory that says that we all have certain needs, and before we can start meeting one of the needs. The needs below it must be met first. That kind of makes sense, right? So if I don't have food or water or shelter, I don't really care about self-esteem. I'm in survival mode. And then you move on up, right? So if I don't have safety, then I don't really care about love and belonging. I'd like to have it, but it's not necessary to me. How many, how has, again, raise your hand if you've never seen this before. So everybody's seen it. Everybody knows what I'm talking about. Or some of you lying. Or some of you are probably lying to me. That's OK. Oh, so you got to go right away. So here's what happens with the poor Industrial Revolution. Oh, actually, so on the first Industrial Revolution, basically, the lowest level was taken care of, food, water, and shelter. That basic human need was mostly taken care of. Second Industrial Revolution, security and stability, or safety, that's what happened when, um, so the second, if you remember, the second one is we had a division of labor. And when we had a division of labor, you had factories, and that means everybody now had a job. It was the first time they had the idea of having a job. You had a, a sustaining income that came in, and that gave a lot of people a sense of safety and comfort. I knew I could constantly be able to provide for my family because this boss man up here gives me a salary. 
All right, so now the third one, uh, esteem, love and belonging. This is an interesting one I'll talk about a little bit later. But esteem came a lot through education. And that's what the third industrial revolution happened for us, is that it commoditized education. So now, as you can see up, as society keeps moving up, each of these basic needs in society in general are completely taken care of. And with the fourth industrial revolution, what's going to force everybody to focus start on is self-actualization. Does it at least make sense in theory, what I'm saying? Yeah? OK. So what that means, all right, first, I want to talk about something really quick. Let's talk about a little bit of reality check. You know, this is kind of nice. It's great. Let's talk about normal society first. So you kind of got your Maslow's hierarchy needs here, like this, right? So these are your basic ones. So this is family, love. Right, this is safety. This one's like food. Shelter. And, and this is basically, can I eat and can I poop without being killed? If you get to the crude point of it. I kind of call this the zombie zone. All right. This is where most people stay, right here. Most people never get past this. And even if we get to a universal income level, most of the people that we service will still kind of stay here. This is just reality. Even if they get a universal income and they can't find identity in the work anymore, they're going to numb out. I just want to point out, it's going to happen. But more importantly, a lot more people are going to be moving up to the top because they're going to be sitting around going, what's my purpose in life? What am I doing? They can't fulfill it by being numbed out by going to work anymore. That's the point. They're not going to have time to be wasting away in a sense where they can be preoccupied with doing some menial labor. And we can already start to see that a lot in the millennial generation in the United States. Most of their basic needs are taken care of. And they're hella upset. They're throwing tantrums. And it's happening everywhere around the world. It's, I kind of look at it as just, well, it's just by the mere fact that the rest of the stuff is all taken care of down here. And we will all, as society and all as people, want to move up this pyramid of needs. And that's all they're doing. They're saying, because if we, uh, uh, how many of us had like hard parents that are sort of like, you know what? I was just happy getting food when I was a young kid. Yeah? And then this is what they told us. But did you ever have problems eating food at home? No, right? So my grandmother would talk about not necessarily food. She was ecstatic about having a blanket because she was cold as sleeping at night. And when she got an extra roll of bread, it was like going to Disneyland. And most of us look at it as sort of like, what do you mean I don't get an extra roll of bread with my salad? This is, I am outraged. This is not normal. My whole point, that's my whole point, is that you, even us have moved on up. Okay, so what does that have to do with products and services? Let's go back to Elon Musk. Why do we like Elon Musk? Because he's a visionary. Because he makes us believe in something that's bigger than ourselves. And that's the self-actualization part. Totally makes sense. Just want to point out there's going to be the zombie zone. So we're not going to save all of humanity, but we're going to be able to touch some of them. OK, next part. Oh, by the way, uh, I'm not an expert on this. So I did a little bit more research. And I came to understand that there are actually more needs than just this. And there's a lot particular for uh, uh, some of us in the room. Oh, wait, where? The slide's missing. Where did it go? It's my one joke I have in here. No. There, there it is. There it is. There is a deeper need that we all have. This is true for people who work on the internet. But then I did some more research and understood there's actually yet a deeper need, particularly for digital nomads. 
battery life. Okay. So my whole point is now we've commoditized all these things. Education is now commoditized. Manufacturing is commoditized. Data, location, work power, you guys can't see it. Connections. How easy is it to connect with people now? Like, how hard is it to find somebody now if you wanted to get a hold of them? Pretty dang easy. You used to have to belong to these big social clubs or it's something you had to be able to pay into. Dude, people are so open now. You can find them on, on Skype, LinkedIn, whatever. I have made myself an introduction to so many well-known people just by sending, sending them a quick message. And they're like, hey, what's up? As long as you're to the point and you've got something that's relevant to them, they'll talk to you. There are no more barriers. There's nothing to hide behind. That's my whole point. You can't hide behind any of the other levels of needs. Nothing. So what that means is that when basic universal income comes, is that employers aren't going to choose, and people are already starting to do this, they're not going to choose just to take a job. They're going to choose motive. Why am I working for this company? Do I really want to work for this boss? And they're not going to take jobs just to take jobs, because they're, they're going to take jobs that have vision. They're going to take jobs that have meaning for them. And the other things is that customers are going to start buying belief in things. What's my product? I buy that product because I believe in it. Now, how many of you, this is particularly awesome for product people, think, how do I put vision in my product? I sell, who sells a, one of the most mod, mundane things out there that is so easy that's copy? What do you got? What's, what, what, it's, what do you sell? Stretch, well, that's, that's actually, that's a pretty good one. The, the psychology of that one's pretty good. Uh, nothing more, yeah. I'm selling gym membership right now. <laughs> awesome. He's ready to hawk his stuff. But how about like um, something really, really simple? Like how about a, a basic, uh, uh, does anybody do any consumable items? Who does, who does what do you do? Supplements. Supplements. Okay. Is there a lot of competition? Right? Do they, you're always worried about competition being able to come in and like nudge you out? Less these days. Less these Why? Days. Uh, you know, mastered it on some level. What do you mean? The marketing. Oh, the marketing. What about the marketing? Maybe, maybe we'll get some tips here. A little bit without giving away the secrets. I'm in the middle of the business now, so I don't have any secrets. I can oh. Them. All right. On the marketing, do you just do basically um, buy the supplement because it's got these things? Or is there a story behind it? Yeah. I'm limited to what I can say, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so sometimes there is, sometimes there's not. But right, you're in a regulated industry, it looks a little bit difficult. So my point is that you can still take a commodity object and put a story behind it. You can attach it to something where people will say, between two commodity objects, I'll take the one that has the story. I'll take the one where they're doing something else with it because people, customers are going to start buying belief. And this is essentially how you become competition proof. This is how you take the process so that you also become premium products. Because when you start having the disposable income, like we're all starting to have a lot more of, you start thinking, some of us, not all of us, I'm spending my money, where is this money going? And if I have the choice of spending a dollar more or two dollars more to pay for the same thing and I feel like it's gonna go to a better thing, a lot of us will buy it. How much would a one or two dollar more profit margin on all your stuff make for you? Quite nice, for sure. Nice, right? It's really that simple. I'm gonna give you some examples how to do that later. Okay, so no better than now. Got to make sure I'm going the right direction, which I'm not. Oh, the sad, sad, small sad violin. This is where I tell you about my sob story. So how did I learn all this? How did I get the eye patch? All right, here's the sad story. Why did I figure this all out? About uh, eight years ago, I think it was like eight, nine years ago, uh, a lot of stuff happened. I had a real estate investment company. It didn't go well. I was, uh, because the economy turned, I was engaged and the girl left 
mysteriously, with no explanation. Um, I was also a pastor at that time. And I know that's the big surprise for a lot of people, like, what the hell? <laughs> yeah, I was. And um, being the nice underling pastor that I was, I had a group of about 300 people coming every single week, coming to hang out, chit chat. And my head pastor goes, I need you to change your times to this and this. And it's basically like Google coming up and putting a slap down on your ability to market. So you can only market your product when everybody's sleeping. That's the only time we're going to allow you to put ads up. That's essentially what he did. I was like, it's going to kill the group. I can't do anything. So when that happened, and I had all a bunch of this cascading stuff, I went into this deep, deep depression. And a suicidal. And that's how I wear the eye patch, is that I got a tumor from the whole thing. And it was it probably from stress. Doctors have still no idea why I have the tumor. So I am the star of three medical journals. Yes, very exciting, because I went to see all these specialists. And they're like, yeah, this is very exciting. Let's talk about it with my doctor friends. I'm like, oh, you know, it's like poke eye. Let's see what's going on. Oh, we don't know what it is. Why don't you go over here? I'm like, OK, let's see what we're answer. Like, oh, yeah, that's very interesting. We don't know what it is either. But let's write it. Let's talk about it to the rest of the medical world. So three times I did that, and they all said, we don't know what it is. Um, so in the midst of my depression, what happened is I could get about one hour of work done. That was it, one hour. And the weird thing was that I wanted to die, but I had a craving to live. And the wanting to die was because I didn't feel like I had control over anything. And death was the one thing that I felt I had control over. It was one last choice that I could make. Because at this point in my life, there are sometimes I literally could not get out of bed. I wanted to. I strived to. And I couldn't do it. Oh, uh, let me tell you the funny part. This isn't so funny, but this is when I knew I was in trouble. I picked up some contracting programming work. And I went to go work on the computer. And I went to push the keys to, to do some work. And I literally couldn't do it. And it freaked me the fuck out. Because I just said, just push any key. I don't care. Just push a key. And there was like something that was like, no, I'm not going to do it. And I literally had this conversation in my head. That I said, you will fucking push a key right now. And I was like, my hands was like, no, fuck you, I'm not. That scared me because I realized I didn't have control over my body anymore. There was something completely wrong with me. And um, so then I went to the point where I was very, I had these dark moments where I wanted, I strived, I wanted to live but I didn't feel like it was possible. So here's what happened. Is that there was days that I could get about one hour's worth of work done. And I thought to myself, I gotta run a business. I can't work, I can't go get a job. How can I make money in one hour? One hour. And I, I had some good friends. And friends, being a pastor, they knew that I could listen and talk. And so they said, you know what? You're always good at helping solving problems. What if I just come over and talk to you? And I said, you know, here's the deal. I'd love to talk to you, but I've only got one hour, and I've got to get some stuff done. If I help you, could you help me? I literally can't do my laundry right now if I spend an hour with you. If I talk to you and help you out, would you do my laundry? Would you go shopping for me? And people are like, yeah, I'll be willing to do that. So that's what happened. That's how coaching started for me, is people would come over. I'd help them from a little bit, help them figure out where the, they were stuck, and they would work for me. So this is how I learned to leverage what I did. I learned to figure out what was more valuable to them in an hour's worth than the hour I spent. So I would somebody come over, and I'd say, like, I need graphic work. I need somebody to do some graphic work. So I'll tell you what, I'll help you strategize business a little bit. I haven't been CEO of a couple other different companies, done some other things, but I could give you some tips. If you were willing to do this graphic project for me, I'll be happy to share. And people are like, that's worth it to me. So one hour of my time was worth five hours of their time. So I learned to leverage just based off one hour, and that's how I rebuilt my business back up. And the funny part was that as I was trying to figure out why do I feel like I want to die, but I feel the desire to live? I had to figure out 
what was unique about me? And it was right in front of me. People were coming over and talking to me. And I could see it. And I'm like, why is it that I still have self-doubt in who I am? Because that's really where my depression was coming from. And what I had to understand was that there's a lot of things I could not do. And I was stressing myself out trying to do all these things that I could not do. And I was putting myself down from all these things that I could not do, thinking I had to be able to do them. When right in front of me, I was doing the one thing that I could do very well. And everybody else was doing all the things I couldn't do. That is the basis of business. That's all you guys have to do. Figure out the one thing you do exceptionally well that you can leverage so that other people can work around you. That's what Elon Musk does. That's the whole reason I'm pointing him out. He's a terrible employer. He's not even that, he's got concepts, but he doesn't actually know the science. He hides all the scientists. But they buy into his vision of what he wants to do. And that's what people did with me. They bought into my vision. I said, this is what I want to do. Here's what I'm going to, you know, here's how you can help me out. This is what I'm going for in life. I'm trying to build a little bit more. I'm helping people understand who they are so that they can accomplish more in their own life. Do you buy into that? And people are like, yes, I buy into that. If they told me no, I just want some advice. I was like, Psh, I don't have time for you. And when I meant I don't have time for you, I literally meant I did not have time for them because I had to get a transaction. I was forced to. Does my story at least make sense on how you can apply it to your life? Yeah? yeah. Okay. Do you see how me becoming self-actualized, me understanding how I leverage myself to make my own business, helped other people believe in what I was doing? Is that too much of a jump? Or is there some yeses out there? Your businesses are no different. My point in all of this is that in no other time in history has it been that this becomes mandatory because all the other stuff that we talked about. Before, vision was kind of nice. You know, you want to do something else. I don't care. I'm gonna, I just got to get a job. Oh, you know what? I just need that product. But because we're all moving up, people are starting these bigger questions. Okay, so that's my sad violin story. No, 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 no. Because I'm really great now. So it's just, that's why I said small. Okay. Whatever you have right now, it's enough right now. I promise you. Whatever you have right now is enough. If you feel stalled out in business, you don't know what the next step is, you've got enough to make it to the next level. If you feel like a fraud, you don't feel like you got anything at all, you got enough right now. I promise you, because there's no, maybe you were worse off than I was, but I doubt it. And if I can do it, I know you guys can do it. Okay, so what's the real process you gotta go through all of this? It's actually quite simple. It only takes about four major lessons. That's it. Four major lessons, and I wanna give you the four major lessons and how to apply it for yourself. And then I wanna give you some examples of how businesses have applied it to their own, for, uh, to their own businesses and how they got success out of it. Okay, uh, first a couple little, um, these are some big concepts that I wanted to try to get into your eyes your head. You can't discover your advantage. How many know what their personal advantage is? Good, 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 good. How many feel like you don't know what yours is? Raise your hands, it's okay. Here's the trick, you can't discover it. You can only rediscover it. The problem is that you lost it. It isn't that it hasn't ever been found, it's that you got away from it at some point. Have you ever had seen a kid that can't play, a small kid? Do small children have troubles make, have, doing make-believe? No. Have you ever, who's ever played with like a young kid? Okay. They're always like, hey, what do you do this? Blah, 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 and have like this imagination. It goes wild. They're playing. They're doing something crazy. This is kids working in their strengths. This is kids working at their advantage. And I'm not talking necessarily that they've got a creative mind but there's a certain way that they think and they act that they naturally do. So what happens over time is somebody tells us that way that you're acting or doing, you can't do that, you can't make money doing that. Or that's not conducive. You have to stop that. Um, 
what are some other things that happen? Uh, we, ha we take on jobs or roles that actually are the opposite of what we're naturally good at. And so at least, does that make sense? So what you have to do is first rediscover what you're naturally good at. And when you do this, I promise you vision and your own determination start coming back again because then you start, in a sense, playing again in a way that's natural for you to play. I'm not saying playing. Some people really love playing business, playing business in a certain way. Okay, next one. Fall in love with your income, in, 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 yes, that word, thank you, that one. Just like I said before, we're, none of us are good at everything. We're probably good at about 10% of our business. And the rest of the stuff, you got to hold on to. You say, like, thank God I am not good at that. And the attitude you really take is because I am fucking awesome in this 10%. I don't need to do the other 90%. I leverage that out. So the number one weight I help people get rid of is that gorilla on their back that they think they've got to do all the SEO. I have to do this. And it's all tied to your own self-worth. Oh, I have to do this or I'm going to look like a fraud. I have to do this. I'm not going to do something I wouldn't give my other employees to do. We all tell ourselves these little lies that somehow we have to become better in something that we're just not naturally good at or we look like a failure or something's wrong with us. So fall in love with your income. In that one, that word. <coughs> because here's the thing. Here's how you do it. Because whatever you're not, there is an opposite to. So if you fall in love with what you're not, you also fall in love with what you are. And that's the important part. Okay, find no faster. We're gonna talk about this. This is your values. What do you particularly want to do? Who do you want to work with? What energizes you? What are the uh, genres you like working in? The faster you can find all the stuff you don't want to do, and instead of just taking all the other things, the faster money will come to you. The faster you learn to say no, the faster the right opportunities will come to you. Those are some general ideas. Okay, so how do you do this? First one, rediscover your, it says discover, but it should say rediscover your sweet spot. Basic, easiest way to do this, everybody knows I love these, is you take personality assessments. Study this thing, figure out what's unique to you. Now, some people are like, are these things scientifically accurate? You know, are they great? It doesn't matter, because when you take them, that is what you think you are, for the most part. As long as you tell yourself honestly, and you just look at it, you go, well, this is what I think I am. This is a starting point for where I am. And they will tell you, here's what your strengths are, and here's what your weaknesses are. And you'll look at it, most people are like, yeah, it's true. And as soon as you look at that empirically on a piece of paper, you're like, oh my gosh, I've been trying to force myself to do all this stuff that I'm not naturally good at. So you let it go. All right, the next one. Optimize your sweet spot. This is an important one, and this is how we start to make money inside of our businesses, in particular if you have a service-based business, how you do it. And if you're leading teams, uh, this is where you're positioned inside the team. So the first, oh, wrong button. Okay, so strengths is the important part here. Your personality is, in a sense, a lot of your talent. So your talent is your core or your raw ability to do something. It is unrefined. Talent in and of itself cannot make money. I can't go up to somebody and say, I am an ENFJ. Please give me some money. Oh, well, that's so impressive. Here's some money. You can't do that. But I can say as an ENFJ, I really like talking to people a lot. Okay, I'll just make this easy. Uh, I have this history of talking to people uh, from being a pastor. And then I have knowledge of a subject. So what I can do is, you know, really simple, I can motivate people and I really enjoy doing it. That becomes my talent. And what I do is I work on improving the knowledge and experience, and as I do that more and more, I now become premium. I become premium because I'm able to find more specific pain that causes problems in people's lives that they're willing to pay more money for. We'll talk about how to do that inside your business if you've got a product pick business. All right, uh, so premium pricing, so that's exactly it. So you find a unique situation of the pain that you're trying to solve. So when I talk about everything's going to self-actualization, 
people are going to start feeling a lot more pain in their life. And they're not going to know how to solve it. So if your products and services figure out how to solve that pain of self-actualization, they will come to you over other products. Okay, so the proof. How do I know this actually works? And this is where I think you guys are going to like it a lot more. By the time, I love talking too long. and Nobody's regulating me, so I am talking a lot. Okay. Here's how it works. So Dr. Dyke Drummond came to me. He had about $50,000 in debt. Uh, he was really, really angry because he got burned out when he was a doctor and nobody was helping him. And he realized like later on the system kind of completely let him down. So what I said is like, what makes you so angry? What is it? Doing? What would you want to change in the world? And he goes, man, I just don't want other people to experience the exact same thing. And I said, okay, great. Do you think it's a problem? Yeah, it's a huge problem. And I said, because he's actually looking more just like a biz off. He was like, I just want to start another business. I want to do something else. And I was like, well, let's see what you got first, because that's the most important thing. Why go get something else if you already got something? Let's figure out what you got. So he had this anger. And I said, well, do you think other people would benefit from you helping them avoid burnout? And he said, yeah. I said, great. So let's start doing that. We also knew he was a very good writer. So he just started writing and putting articles out there. So now he's the number one expert in doctor prevention burnout. So he travels the world. Uh, he, uh, now this guy, I tell you, he's, he, he is an action taker. Like I just, I don't understand how he takes action. Like I just get tired looking at how much action he takes. Um, but his problem was that he was doing things that were anti him. So we found an assistant that was a comparable personality type that could deal with his high drive and believed in his vision. This is the important part. His vision was to help other doctors burn out. So we didn't just find another assistant. We found an assistant that had the exact same story in her life. Her father had burnt out. So it was personal to her. So when she's helping him, she felt like she was helping her own father. And what that allowed her to do was to start optimize his business in the background. He didn't have to tell her, please do this, please do that, please do this because she believed in the vision. And so she kept on coming up going, I think we could get more people if we did this. I think if you did this, you'd be able to improve this. She was automatically looking on how to optimize. That's my point of vision when you sell vision to your employees. If you get people on board with the vision where they're going, they will self-optimize your business. You won't have to go through the process of, please fill out this SOP, please follow the SOP, please come tell me when you do something wrong. Because management becomes a lot easier. Because what you do is you simply go, what's the action you took? And they tell you, is it in line with the vision? Does it meet the standards and the values they used with the company? And the person says, oh my gosh, no, it didn't. You simply go, what do we need to do to correct it? And they will figure it out themselves. Whereas if somebody is not on board with the vision, you got to go through the uphill battle of trying to explain it over and over again. All right? So let's get forward. Okay. Uh, go through. Now he's got six tables coaches. He's got $6 million of, of, of revenue. He just bought a house on, on Puget Sound, which is a very expensive place. And look at, look at that little fucker. Isn't he happy looking? All right. Dave Huss. A lot of people know Dave Huss. I've used his story before, but the reason I'm bringing it up is because I just talked to him, and he has grown a lot more. By the way, all these people went through the exact same thing that I just gave you in those three, those three steps. Bump, 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 bump. All we've done is expand a little bit more on it. Um, he was just making money. He lost a lot of motivation inside of his business. And I was trying to figure him out. So he, he did Teespring. A lot of people know he did Teespring, right? And he's like, dude, I'm just tired of making t-shirts. I'm making t-shirts and nobody seems to care. And I was like, dude, what drives you? What makes you excited in life? And he goes, I don't like being the face of anything. Because we look like, you know, maybe you want to be a brand or something. He's like, I hate being a brand. I don't want anybody to like it. I just want to make some money and be left alone. That's my job. That's what I want. And I was like, well, you know, that's great, but then you stagnate. But what gets you really excited when you're hanging out with other people? What, what just makes you giggle? Even if you don't have to be seen doing it, you felt like your little fingers are in there and you had a little, little access to it. And he goes, I love helping other people perfect their craft. That was his thing. That was his thing. I just like watching other people perfect their craft. And I said, well, what products do you have Well, that's craft related? What products do you sell where people are working on something of their craft? And I'm thinking more like a, a figurative craft. And he goes, 
well, I got this knitting product. I got this quilting product. And I was like, what are you talking about? He goes, well, I do these quilt shirts for grandmas. And I was like, okay, you're 25 years old and you make quilt shirts for grandmas. And he goes, yeah. And I was like, well, if you, would you be stoked if you could help grandmas make better quilts? And he just goes, yeah. <laughs> that is the weirdest thing for a 25-year-old man that likes to travel the world to say, yeah, I would. So what we did, we created the Facebook group. And he invited a bunch of people on. He started posting all of these quilt patterns. And then he happened to say, oh, you know what? I just want you guys to be able to make awesome quilts for your grandchildren. I want you to be able to do this. Because people like to sell quotes for like, uh, people that are in cancer. By the way, here's a, here's a pattern for uh, uh, somebody who's in cancer. Oh, by the way, I happen to sell a t-shirt. You want to buy one? Boom. Sales went up. That's how you take products and you put vision behind it. A mundane, boring t-shirt. And he found a niche that was able to turn into a raving fan base. So uh, the other thing was that we were able to do is we cut his hours in half. And he was able to 5x his sales. And then I just, I just texted him last night, 2 o'clock in the morning. I said, bro, I haven't talked to you for a year. What's going on? And this is what he tells me. He says, hey, uh, sure, you can tell my story. I'd love to be at DC next, blah, blah, blah. Uh, three years. He, he's going to some Tony Robbins event next week. Yeah. Christopher, uh, with your help, I made the commitment to focus 100% on grandma hobbies instead of doing my many random niches t-shirts. I also appreciate your, my unique strengths and weaknesses and adjusted my business to fit them. That 5x my income, as you mentioned, in your Dropship Lifestyle talk, that was a couple years ago. What's even more interesting is that the benefits of coaching uh, continue accumulating after that we were done. I don't really perform magic. All it is, I did those three things. You guys can go do all the same thing. The point is that once you get that stuff in your head, it has repercussions in your business you don't realize. So I'm in the mindset, blah, blah, blah. I was able to crush it, and I'll be able to five an additional 5X. So he's 25 did. OK, next one. Uh, I'll go with these really quickly. Um, same problem. He was not motivated. And same thing, he was stuck. He was just doing too many things that were outside of his wheelhouse. Once we got him outside of his wheelhouse, he was able to, and figure out what he really, who he enjoyed really working with. Ah, damn it, damn it again. Uh, he really enjoys working with celebrities and startups, and he was doing too many things because he was doing app development. I said, let's only focus on these two things because you really enjoy working on those. Let's see if we can't leverage those things. We did that. We also hired another production manager because he was trying to do all the stuff too much. And as soon as he was able to do that, we were able to double his sales, uh, actually net in six months and he was able to get an outside investor. Christopher Sutton, you guys know who this guy is, right? DC is like everywhere on DC. Uh, you can read all these things, but the important part is more this. So again, I texted him last night, and he goes, I was just talking to Nat, which is his wife, and she remembered how a few years ago, working, I was working from 7 a.m. to midnight, pretty much every day, fueled by caffeine. Things got better a little bit, and then basically after coaching, again, nothing that I do fantastic, uh, I now it feels like my business is stable, um, even though I feel that's more relaxed and I can take more time off. I can enjoy spending time with my wife and baby and daughter. I have a team that I can trust to do a majority of the day-to-day -day work. So how do you got the team? Again, he sold the vision. He sold the vision of what his company was. Was We didn't just hire people to do the work. We found people that enjoyed doing music. So if you guys don't know it, he's got this SaaS business online that teaches people to become more musical. By the way, we changed that a little bit, because I said, dude, no one knows what it means to be musical. But what we do is people know people want to become a rock star. We'll help people become rock stars. And he's like, well, I don't know, it's not really the worth it. I'm like, just change some of the wording in there, because that's the real pain that people are suffering from. Sure enough, that's what helped a lot. Um, but here's the important part. And to get to focus mostly on the big, exciting 10x things like partnership. And everybody's seeing his uh, thread. A lot of people have seen his thread inside of DC. So that's, again, all he's done is learn to work inside of his strengths. And we've changed the working inside of his uh, ads and stuff to talk about the vision. And that's how we're able to get more signups. OK, uh, that's pretty much it. If you want to know exactly where you are, this is the end, you can take a small little quiz on my website. And I'll tell you exactly where you are stuck. it will tell you, do you know your personality well enough? Have you been able to niche yourself out enough? Do you need to learn how to make yourself a more of a premium product and how to do that? It's a very quick guide. It takes about, or the quiz takes about uh, maybe a minute or two minutes, and most of you take it. And then you'll get a specific download to where you are at. But that's it. I've gone over time. Then maybe got some questions. Then I did it perfectly. Okay. <laughs>
video. And if you want to take a quiz on knowing where you suck in your business, click on the button over here that says quiz. And also, you can subscribe to my YouTube channel. You should do that.